So this morning, knowledge is good. I love, anybody else love random factoids? Like you just stumble across things, or maybe you don't stumble across them, but you, you seek them out and try to find those things, and then you just love to, anybody else? Okay, like I'm seeing a few of you, you're nodding your head, you're like, yeah, that's, that's me. Okay, so I stumbled across this recently. Um, ants. So there are researchers at the University of Hong Kong. They say that they have finally calculated uh, an accurate estimation of how many ants there are in the world. Okay, now I realize it's an estimation, so we can't, like, none of us are gonna be able to tell whether they're right or whether they're wrong, but I'm just going with it, okay? Because this is, I, I, I read this this week, don't ask me how I read it or what rabbit trail I was down when I read this, but I read it, okay? Um, they said that it is an unimaginable amount of ants. They estimate that there are 20 quadrillion ants living on Earth, that is 2.5 million ants per human being. 2.5, some of you are like, I'm starting to feel like itchy right now or you know, whatever. 2.5 million ants per human being that is walking the face of this earth. If you use something to lure all of the ants in the world onto a scale, they like watermelon. Maybe we use watermelon to draw them to a giant scale where we could measure them. They estimate that they would weigh about 12 megatons of dry carbon, which is more than the weight of all the wild mammals and birds on the earth. That's insane. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about this morning. <laughs> but I just learned that this week and I thought, I'm gonna share that because I have the microphone and I can do that, so. Um, <laughs> but I, I do, I love, I love, uh, I love knowledge. I love, information is great, learning things is great. There's, there's something, I really enjoy that, right? Knowledge is good. It's led to all kinds of good things in our lives, hasn't it? I mean, like, we don't have to look real far to go, knowledge has improved our, I'm turn this on here. Knowledge has improved our standard of living, our quality of living, right? If you, just think about this, okay, let me rattle off just a few things, a few thoughts. From the Garden of Eden until the beginning of the 20th century, so just a little over 100 years ago, people had two options for transportation other than like a boat or something, right? You, you either had to ride a horse or you walked. I mean, that was essentially it, right? That's it. So for thousands of years, that was it. And in the span of about 100 years since the turn of the 20th century, we have had the knowledge to develop cars, and not just cars, but I mean cars that are amazing, unimaginable, even 25, 30 years ago, right? Other than the fact that they're not flying yet, which the Jetsons gave me false hope of that as a child, that we would have flying cars by the time I was uh, in my mid-40s. But in the span of that, we've, we've had the opportunity to develop cars, to develop trains, to develop flight, and where flight is normal, it's totally normal for us to just strap into a chair and then fly into the sky and just land someplace. In a couple of hours, we are hundreds or thousands of miles away from where we started. Space shuttles to get into outer space. I mean, it's, it's amazing to have gone from walking or riding horses in just a little over 100 years um, I mean, that's crazy how transportation has changed. Um, how about life expectancy? I mean, life at the time of Jesus, so a couple thousand years ago, the life expectancy of, uh, of, of, a, of a normal human being was about 30 years on average. Jesus lived about 30 years. That was about average for his time. And what's crazy to me is that the the average lifespan of human beings from that time, from the time of Jesus until into the 1800s, didn't really move. It stayed, like your average lifespan even into uh, the 1800s was 37 years old. So it had improved by just a handful of years over almost 2,000 years. And then all of a sudden with all the medical advancements and how much our knowledge has increased, uh, just in the last little bit here, the current life expectancy in the Western world is roughly 82 years old. If you're going 150 years-ish, somewhere in there, 200 years-ish, we've jumped from 37 years, it had stayed at 30 years for thousands of years, and we jumped to 82 years old because of medical technology and public health education. I mean, I, like, I've had 
friends, family members in like recent years who have had heart attacks and have had heart stints put in or bypass surgeries that are done. And I'm not saying it's no big deal because it's a big deal to have those surgeries, but compared to what it was 20 years ago, compared to what it was 40 years ago to have open heart surgery, to have triple bypass surgery, I mean, we're, it's, it's insane to see the work that's being done on people and then they're just up and about, walking around, living their lives and they've got to rehab and do some things. But I mean, it's, it's crazy. The advancements in knowledge and technology, it's changed a lot of things. For thousands of years, people gathered around fires and candles to read, to write, to do the dishes. Now we just, you know, light candles and gather around fires for ambiance. It's not for survival. I mean, you know, we might want to heat our houses with wood, and that's great if we want to do that. I want to do that. But we don't have to do that, right? And so you go, people gather around candles and they gather around fireplaces uh, to do all these different things. 130 years ago, if we were in this room, it would be super dim. There would be candles that were lighting this room. And you'd barely even be able to see my face. There'd be no amplification. I don't actually have a strong voice, so I wouldn't be good at public communication like this because I don't have a booming voice that carries. I mean, this, like all of these things, it's all completely changed with electricity. I, it's to the point now where like, I don't know if anybody else feels this, but I feel like I'm the only human being in my house that turns off lights. <laughs> Does anybody else feel that way? There have been a few times in uh, recent months where I have, like, Carrie and I have gone out of town, and we leave our kids home now. It's like, they, they, they care for themselves. And I don't, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's being a little too <laughs> optimistic. They, they survive, okay? <laughs> maybe they don't care for themselves, but they survive, okay? And my neighbor is always kind of keeping an eye on things when we're out of town. He's, you know, just, 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 he knows when we're leaving, and and he keeps an eye on stuff, and he's always laughing, being like, when you leave, your electric bill has got to be through the roof for those three days that you're gone. He's like, he's like, you were gone, and I literally round the clock, he's like, your attic lights were on, your basement lights were on, every single light bulb in your house was on, your house was lit up like a Christmas tree, 3.30 in the morning, lit up. <laughs> Five in the morning, lit up. 11 o'clock at night, lit up. Noon, Lit up. Doesn't need to be, but it's lit up, you know? Um, like, we're in this place now, though. The technology that we have, the fact that we just push a switch and everything lights up. It's, and then the extension of that. It's not just lights, but it leads to what we carry around in our pockets, the smart devices and all this other stuff. I could go on and on about all of the improvements, all due to an increase in our knowledge. And these are great things. We have vastly improved the quantity of our life, and the quality of our life in many different ways, all because of an increase in knowledge, all because of an increase in knowledge that has led to technology. But the question has to be asked, has any of this helped us in the search for meaning in our lives? And I would argue, no. I mean, maybe in some ways because of the quantity and the quality but, of our lives, but, but mostly, no, it hasn't helped us increase in our understanding of our lives and the meaning of our lives. In general, the increase in knowledge hasn't helped humanity find God. In general, uh, it's pushed us the other way. And we come to a scripture like we're going to read right now from Solomon in Ecclesiastes. And I hope you can hear in my excitement about like everything that I was just saying, all the, I'm so grateful for all of the technological increases. I'm so grateful for knowledge. This is not some, what I'm about to lay out for you is not some sort of Luddite argument for destroying technology and we need to go back to the Stone Ages and you know, whatever else. Like, I mean, this, is not, this is not where we're coming from. But we have to do something with a verse like what we're about to read, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12. Solomon, writing, he said, I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. Now, Solomon, again, as a refresher, king of Israel, brilliant, wise. He was actually known as a pioneering botanist and zoologist in his time. Like, this guy 
This guy craved knowledge, and he searched it out, and he used it in really practical ways, okay? And he said, so as he studied and explored wisdom and all that's done under the heavens, what a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And again, meaningless can be translated as vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. There's no, there's no substance to it, right? And we've been saying this, you read Ecclesiastes, get some chocolate, get a quarter of your favorite ice cream because it's kind of depressing. You read it and you're like, I need to eat snacks right now. I need to like, whatever you got to do to make it through, right? Okay, because what Solomon is doing is he's, he's recapping all of these things in his life that he has searched for meaning from. And they have left him wanting. They've left him going, I thought I was anchoring myself to something substantial, but it, but it's not, right? And so he says, what a burden. It's all meaningless. It's all vapor, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. And the more knowledge, the more grief. Now, again, what we're talking about here is not all the, each week we're going through Ecclesiastes and we're hitting on a different topic. And, and I have to say this really loud and clear and many times so that nobody's misunderstanding what we're saying. None of the things that we're talking about in any of these weeks are bad in and of themselves. Knowledge is not bad. Knowledge can be a great thing. It's the issue of where our priority is being placed in these things. And so we talked about, in the first week, I told a story about a, a young man named Chris McCandless who went out into the wilderness of Alaska to try to just survive in the wild on his own. And it's this crazy story. There's a book that's written about it, Into the Wild. And he ends up dying, and they find his body dead in this, like, abandoned camper. And it's this really sad story. But the crazy thing was is he had unknowingly been poisoning himself. He was eating plants, thinking that they were going to sustain him as he was surviving on his own in the wild. And each day, he's eating these plants, trying to fill his body with the nutrients that he needed, but what he was actually doing was poisoning his body, and his organs were actually shutting down, and by the time he realized what was going on, it was too late. And there's a whole lot more to the story, but we made the point that our culture, as human beings, we reach out for all kinds of things. God has created us. We'll talk in the coming weeks, but in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of humankind. There is something in us that longs for deeper meaning, that longs for deeping per deeper purpose, and that's not our broken humanity. That's God wiring us that way that we would find him. And we end up like chasing after all these other things and we're like this kid, Chris McCandless, and we're feeding ourselves all kinds of things that we think are going to help us in our search for meaning, but they're actually poisoning us when we make them the main thing. And so when we talk about knowledge, knowledge is amazing. I love it. I love, there's nothing better to me than having free time where I don't have any other obligations and I can read. I love it. I love it. It's one of the best things. I love to increase in my knowledge. But the problem in knowledge and the problem in all the things we're talking about is again, when we take good things and we try to make them the first thing, that's where we run into problems. And so the promotion of knowledge as number one, as the first thing in our lives, now again, we, we, wouldn't, we would say, oh, there's lots of other things that are more important to us, but if you look at our cultural value right now, knowledge is up there. It's up there for all of us, whether it's in the degrees that we want to earn in order to prove ourselves or to open up specific doors for ourselves or whatever it is. And again, I, degrees are great. Learning is great. But when we're pegging all of our hopes on that education, on that increase in knowledge, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. That's when we get ourselves into trouble. And so 
but it's not just the pursuit of degrees. It's not just school learning or school knowledge that we're talking about. There's actually more to it. There's, in our culture, there's a mindset that we are basically, we're just rational beings. We are brains with legs. And if we can just amass enough knowledge, if we can just understand the universe and understand the human body, and, and I mean, we, like we, in our culture, we have a, a voracious appetite for knowledge. We want to know things, and that's put inside us by God. He created us to explore and to learn. That's why he gave us the capacity to learn, because he wants us to use it to learn. But there is something in our culture where we look at ourselves, we look at human beings, and we think that there, we have the capacity in ourselves to think or to know or to understand ourselves into utopia all on our own. And if we can just know enough, and if we can just educate the world enough, then all of the world's problems will go away. And we can get what we all long for, which is perfection, we can get that, but we can get it on our own. That's the more insidious danger with knowledge in our culture. So Solomon, uh, just a chapter later from the first passage that I read from him, he said, Ecclesiastes 2, 12, Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So you can see he's, he, he's talking about his search for knowledge, but in his search for knowledge, he's, he's thinking deeper. I, I'm pursuing knowledge and I'm searching it out and wisdom is better than foolishness. But in the end, you know a lot of stuff and then you die. <laughs> I mean, right? I'll, we'll just say it like it is. I mean, I, like, I could spend every minute of every day reading and learning all kinds of things. Or, or let's take, I, I love listening to brilliant people teach. So let's think of the most brilliant minds that you know of. People that, I mean, they're digging deep into specific topics and they just, they know all this. It's amazing. But in the end, they die. And we die. And he's going, listen, does knowledge actually change or impact what is most important in life? Is that the thing that we should be hanging our hat on? And he's going, I don't think so, because I searched it out, and the same fate comes to people who don't increase in knowledge and people who do increase in knowledge. Now, a great argument can be made about wisdom and having knowledge that we apply correctly and all of this stuff, but the bottom line is knowledge isn't the answer. You and I cannot know enough stuff. It's not possible to know enough stuff that will satisfy the spiritual needs that we all have. We can spend our lives mining the depths of knowledge and insight. But in the end, if it's not leading us towards God, it's not going to make a hill of beans difference. Now, again, I'm not saying progress is bad, knowledge is pointless. I'm grateful for advances in our culture, super grateful so what we end up with is we're kind of sitting in this tension, right? Where there is a positive to increase in knowledge, but there's also a negative. Increase in knowledge, when you think about it, especially in our culture that searches out understanding the way that we do. Increase in knowledge is in some ways, 
It's a, a rejection of the past. It's a, yes, this is what we thought before, but is that actually what's true, right? And there's something really powerful about that. There's also something really dangerous about that. And there is a Polish philosopher, and I don't know, I'm not Polish, so I don't know. I think, I think you pronounce it Lizak Kolakowski, but he says this, okay? And I love this. this. This sums up the tension that we're talking about. He says, there are two circumstances we should always keep simultaneously in mind. First, if the new generations had not continually revolted against inherited tradition, we would still be living in caves. Second, if revolt against inherited tradition should become universal, we would soon be back in caves. Does anybody feel like this is what's going on in our culture right now? If you refuse to look at the past and go, I think we can learn from this, and I think we can improve on this, and I think we can grow in our understanding. If, if, if we didn't do that, if we didn't, he says revolting, if we didn't revolt against previous culture or previous understanding or previous knowledge in certain ways, we would still be living in caves, rubbing sticks together, trying to start fire. And at the same time, if all we do is continue to revolt against tradition, at some point, we will end up back where we started. And I think that that kind of accurately sums up some of the danger that we're in. We're at a point in our culture where it's like, like even in 2015, we were so stupid. Like our morality in 2015, the way we understood human beings seven years ago, we're so much more advanced now. And we understand what needs to happen in our culture. I'm speaking kind of tongue-in-cheek right now. It's not just looking back like people in the 1930s, ridiculous, the way that they function. I mean, there is that. But there's literally like, yeah, two years ago we were stupid. It's all about right now and what we know right now. We're so much smarter and we're so much better off, but what if all we're doing is revolting and revolting and revolting from what has been known and revolting until we're actually on our way back to dwelling in caves? And maybe not just physically dwelling in caves, but in our mindset or our understanding of reality. So I spent a large portion of my childhood shivering. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin. And I was a skinny kid. I didn't have a whole lot of insulating uh, layers to me, and so I was always cold. This was made more pronounced by the fact that my family was into water skiing. So we would go water skiing early on in the year and then late in the year as well. And in either of those instances, I mean, you know, like swimming in lakes in Wisconsin, it doesn't really matter if it's July or August. Like, it's still, you know, it's cold, right? So I have like very fond memories of growing up learning. My dad was huge into it, so we would go water skiing a fair amount. Um, and I like very fond memories of, of growing up, learning, spending time with my family, all this stuff. But mixed in with the fondness was just, I think my lips were a little blue and I think I was just kind of like shivering all the time, right? Because I was like immersed in this water that was ice cold. And then the only time you get out of the water is to get up and have 30 mile an hour winds blowing on you as you're wet, being pulled, you know, on pieces of wood on top of the water, holding a rope in your hands, right? So I was just like always freezing, and I just remember always like just having a, right? Like we know that, that you immerse yourself in cold water and it has an effect on you. Now eventually you just get used to it if you stay in it. The problem with water skiing is you're just in and out of it all the time, in and out of it all the time. And if you could just stay in it, you wouldn't really even notice that you'd kind of warm up to it. And our culture right now the way that we think and approach knowledge, I think, is sort of like water. We're swimming in it, but we don't even really realize just how much we've been impacted and affected by the way that our culture approaches knowledge. So I wanna just really briefly hit on a couple of different things and we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll pull this around to what a proper approach to knowledge is, okay? Um, so, since the Enlightenment, as human beings have changed the way that they looked at learning, 
we've stepped into a way of approaching the world that um, it's all about empiricism, empirical evidence. What can I see? What can I touch? What can I hear? What can I taste? What can I smell? What can I measure? What's quantifiable? How can I use the five senses to understand myself and the world around me better, right? And this is what has led to all of these increases in knowledge that we've experienced, like I rattled off at the beginning of, of our time here this morning. It's led to all of those increases. Um, so empiricism or materialism, not in like, I just want a faster, nicer car, but materialism as in like, the material world is, is what it, it's what there is, and that's the end of existence, existentialism, okay? That, that's it. There's a lot of words that we could use for this. Scientism, a quantifiable mindset, the idea of the scientific method, all these things, they're kind of all under the same umbrella, okay? These things are good. They are good. They have led to massive advances. They are great if they stay in their lane. But the problem is, is that in our culture, we don't want them to stay in their lane, which is one way to approach learning and one way to approach our existence as human beings. When we actually consider being as a human, being alive, our existence as a human, there is a whole lot going on that once empiricism or materialism or scientism or whatever has said all that it can say about the phenomena of our existence, of our being. Once it said everything that it can say, there is still much that is left unsaid. Do you hear that? Once we have measured and probed and tested and plumbed the depths of all the things that are quantifiable, there is still a whole lot that has never been said about our existence as human beings. What it means to be a human being. All that can be known about being is not accessible through sense knowledge, through our five senses, or, or even if we use tools to increase our senses, right? So telescopes and microscopes and, you know, all of these laboratories and all this kind of stuff, which again, we can and should be for all of that. I am all for that. All for it. I love it. But we have to realize that once they've said all that they can say, there's still so much more for us to know. There's so much more for us to know. Now, all of this, what we're talking about, the empiricism, materialism, you know, scientism, whatever, fill in the blank with whatever we're talking about. All of that is great if you're talking about developing an iPhone or if you're talking about dentistry. Like, I, I don't want a medieval dentist working on me. Uh, does anybody else feel that way? Like, I, I am glad for advances. I'm very, very glad. So all of those things are really, really great when we're talking about that kind of stuff. Um, but the problem comes in, like what I said, where we get to this place where everything old is bad, and we reject because we're pursuing newer, deeper understanding all the time, and we're hanging all of our hopes on that. And what ends up happening, hang with me here, okay? What ends up happening, sociologists say that we're moving into what they would refer to as a third culture. So all of this enlightenment mentality, empiricism, materialism, modernity, all of it, it's led us to the place where uh, sociologists refer to it as a third culture. So first culture would be all about um, the underpinnings of the way that they understood the world. It would, it would be, all of it would have to do with myth and with fate. You don't control anything, and it's all mythological belief that you have, okay? These are mostly ancient cultures. You probably still have some cultures right now that are functioning that way, but very few, and they're getting fewer and fewer in more and more remote places in the world. Um, that moved into a second culture. Second culture was Christianity is the best example of this, and Christendom where Christianity shaped not only the way that governments were being formed, but the way that human beings understood themselves and understood the, the world around them. Rather than myth and fate, which is uncontrollable and it's unknowable in a lot of different ways, now second culture was being undergirded by faith. There is a, a knowable God. There's knowable truth about ourselves and about other people. That's a second culture. A third culture is moving beyond that second culture, and it is moving into a place where... Um, 
really all that's left is ourselves. Rather than myth or faith, which is the first culture, rather than faith, which is the second culture, we have underpinning and undergirding our understanding of ourselves, it's just ourselves. And our ability to rationalize and our ability to think and our ability to figure out solutions to the problems that we have, again, not bad things in and of themselves, but when all of our hope is being pinned to that, that's a dangerous place to be. And so materialism, enlightenment, empiricism led to a third culture. Third culture has led to anxiousness. And there was a, uh, a man by the name of Edwin Friedman. And he was a cultural and systemic psychologist. Um, he said that institutions, traditions, the way that we function within our culture, whether those are cultural, um, in whatever form they take, whether those are family institutions, the institution of marriage, all these different kinds of things, that institutions, part of the purpose they serve within cultures is to absorb anxiety. That the function of a family that's healthy is to absorb, the world throws all kinds of stuff our way, but when we have a safe, solid home life, that structure, that institution absorbs anxiety. And now it's lessened, and we can handle more in the world. That institutions like the church, or educational institutions, or governmental institutions, they, part of what they do in our culture is they help to fray anxiety. And so we locate ourselves in these institutional systems, and they serve to help to fray some of the anxiety that we feel as human beings, okay? And Friedman was arguing 40 years ago that where our culture was moving in all this attacking what has been and critiquing what has been, again, some of that is necessary to have progress, but at some point it becomes damaging. And he was arguing that what's actually happening is there is an undermining and a destruction of the institutions in the world around us, and what's going to happen is Th that feature of absorbing anxiety is no longer going to be there, and anxiousness is going to skyrocket. Does anybody else? I mean, like, he's a Jewish guy, Jewish scholar, Edwin Friedman, but I mean, I, that's, that's spot on. That's what's happening. Anxiety is through the roof. And it's not just a personal anxiety that we have, it is a systemic anxiety. Because we are hanging our hats and hanging our hopes on ourselves and our ability to understand and our knowledge and to think our way through to a new solution and we're discarding all of the past. It's why there's been the explosion in the last 100 years of anxiety. The Enlightenment, empiricism, materialism, modernity, however you wanted to describe it, it leads to nihilism, which is the belief that there's no meaning. There's, there's no meaning. The end of us putting ourselves and our own rational minds in the driver's seat is that we work ourselves to a place where we're exactly in the spot that Solomon was in he just got there thousands of years ahead of us where he's going, I searched it out. I plumbed the depths of knowledge and understanding and in the end, it's like chasing the wind. It's meaningless. It's vapor. And I hung my hat on that and it's not doing what I need it to do for me. So where do we go with this? I know, I, I know I'm kind of all over the place here this morning. But where, where do we go with this? Because knowledge is not bad. Where we go with this is that knowledge has to be kept in its proper place. And what we know about matters. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Paul is writing. And he's going to, I'm going to read you a passage. He's going to get into the mechanics of our salvation. Okay, 
all kinds of things about the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the suffering of Christ and all of this stuff, and it's all the mechanics of how God carried out what he carried out. As we read it, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact. Don't get lost in all the mechanics of our salvation and lose sight of the, what we're actually talking about here. Because as we're talking about salvation, we're talking about, at its most basic form, for God so loved the world, okay? You, me. He says this, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing, there's knowledge, Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or from my own working or striving, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know, there's knowledge, Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now again, don't get lost so much in the mechanics of what's being said here. Paul is basically saying, because of God's great love for you, he has pursued you in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing greater that you can spend your life on than pursuing a deeper and deeper and deeper knowledge and understanding of that great love that drove God to those great lengths to give of himself for your sake and for my sake. There is nothing better we can spend our life on than diving headlong into the riches of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the love of God that would drive Jesus to do what he did for me and what he did for you. And so knowledge of that love, that is the first thing. That is the first knowledge. And it doesn't mean that we don't care about empirical evidence and science and all, absolutely not. We should actually dive even more headlong into those things because when we understand the knowledge of who God is and how he engages us in the world and what drives him to love us the way that he loves us, we ought to want to explore the world that he has given to us even more. We ought to want to explore the bodies that he has blessed us with even more to understand the great wisdom, the all-surpassing ability that God has to bring all that we see and all that we know and all that we understand in existence, to design it and to bring it into existence. That ought to make us really, really hungry to know even more but not to hang our hat on that knowledge. We hang our hat on the knowledge of Jesus and him crucified. We hang our hat on the knowledge that God loves you and God loves me. And because of that great love, he's pursued us. And out of that understanding, when we're rooted in that understanding, now all of a sudden all of the degrees that we can earn all the knowledge that we gain from our places of employment, all of the ways that we learn to survive in our world, all of this stuff, it matters deeply because it's infused with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's infused with the goodness of a God that loves you and pursues you, and it matters. It matters deeply, but if we get the order switched around, we find ourselves in a spot like Solomon, like the culture around us right now, riddled with anxiety going, I, nobody's saying it, but what you see playing out in front of us is I've come to the, like, it feels like we're getting to the end of what we know and what we can do. Like, how far can you advance before we end up back in caves? How far can you advance before you've attacked everything and torn down everything and there's nothing that's left standing? And what it feels like our culture is crying out in an unspoken way, is I've reached the end of it, and I feel like, that what is the point 
in this. I feel helpless and I feel hopeless. And the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. So, I want to I pray this morning. And I want to just say, if you are watching online or if you're in this room listening and, and, and you've not allowed the Lord to grab hold of your heart and grab hold of your life, you've not allowed yourself to be captured and captivated by the love of God through Jesus Christ, this morning is the time for you to do that. The scriptures say that God stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks and he waits for us to open the door to welcome him in. And so I would encourage you as I pray, I'm going to just pray, and if you have a desire for that, whether it's for the first time or whether you're coming back to the Lord, then I just want you to agree with the words that I'm praying. To agree in your heart and to agree in your mind that that is what you want. That you don't want to hang your hopes on yourself and your own ability or other people and their abilities to reason or to think or to discover or to figure out, but you want to hang your hopes on him. Let's pray. Let's ask God to do that in our lives. God, we thank you for knowledge. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for the, the depth and the intricacy of this world and the, the power of the minds that you have given to us, God. We thank you for everything that you've given to us. It is good. It is good. But God, we confess this morning that we may have hung our hopes on our ability to understand we may have hung our hopes on our ability to measure and quantify and taste and touch and smell and hear and see. But God, there is more to our existence than that, and we confess that this morning. We acknowledge that there is more to this world and there is more to our lives, to our existence, than just what we can measure and understand. And so God, humbly we come before you, Humbly we say to you, God, we want to know Christ and Christ crucified and the love that drove him to that place. God, may that be the first knowledge that we have, the first knowing that we have. May we pin our hopes on your pursuit of us, on your forgiveness of us, on your healing of us, May we pin our hopes on you knowing us better than we could ever know ourselves. And God, out of that, would you breathe life and joy and hope into all of the other knowings that we have in our lives. Pack them full of kingdom meaning, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, um, each week we've been given a practical tip on how do you keep this particular aspect in its proper perspective. And so I want to just uh, throw this out there. One simple thing, if you've been around here before, you've heard us say it multiple times. Um, If the water that we're swimming in is shaping us in certain ways that we don't even realize it, then one of the most forming things in our life right now, it's discipling us more than we realize, is our phones. It's where we get our news. It's where we get all the social updates on whatever else is going on. It's where we get all of this stuff. And so my challenge, our challenge to you would be if we want to keep knowledge in its proper place, then I would encourage you to get into God's word before you get into your phone every morning. It's a simple thing, but to go, I will dig into scripture, whether it's one verse or one chapter or 10 chapters, it doesn't matter, but get into Get into God's word before you get into your phone, before you check your email, before you check your calendar for the day ahead, before you check your messages from all of your family and your friends and everybody else, before you check work for Slack, you know, Slack for work or whatever it is, before you check the headlines, tune into what God is saying. Tune into who he is and what he says about you and about the world around you. Out of that place, then, all the rest of knowledge will fit into the place where it's supposed to be. That would be my encouragement to you. It's not easy, but I dare you this week, when your alarm goes off, before you check anything else, spend just a few moments in God's word and see how that frames up your day. See how it alerts you to the way that you might be being formed for the rest of the day. So, love you guys. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll catch you back here next week.